Hello there, I'm Chris Chapuanya and welcome to another edition of uh, the Oil Now webinar series. This is actually part two of the Gas to Power series that we started some weeks ago. Um, joining us today is Kevin Ramnarine. He's the former Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, no stranger to uh, most of you uh, watching this program in Guyana and around the world. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago itself has been in the oil and gas industry for well over 100 years. Kevin, let's get into it. Um, you are familiar with uh, the government of Guyana's plan to run a pipeline to shore from the Elisa field. Um, and this is to bring gas. Um, there are large volumes of associated gas being produced with the oil offshore. Um, the latest estimate we've seen is about 20% of the eight, nine billion barrels of oil equivalent offshore um, would be gas. And there are many conversations going on here in Guyana from various stakeholder groups as it relates to what that means for the country um, with specific interest on the environmental impact, the potential economic impact, um, and generally what the cost would be in terms of finance, money, dollars and cents, as well as um, what the cost would be to the country long-term. Um, you, being the former Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs in Trinidad and Tobago, and Trinidad itself, um, being in the industry for over 100 years, the oil and gas industry, um, it's good to speak with you to get some perspective. Before we get into the substantive aspect of the discussion, I wanted to just uh, mention some basic facts about the Trinidad uh, and Tobago industry, and you know, you can briefly comment on it. Um, what, what, what I see here based on the statistics from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, I'm seeing the name is now. Um, the first well was drilled around 1857 um, and then commercial production started in 1908. I think it's interesting to note too that Trinidad really started with oil production um, and not gas. And that began um, approximately 113 years ago back in 1908. Um, then in 1914, production reached the 1 million barrel per year mark, which was really around 83,000 uh, barrels per day. That quickly ramped up to uh, 833,000 barrels per day by the 1930s. Um, and interesting to know that that amount went all the way to 5.4 million barrels per day, according to the statistics here around 1967. Um, as it relates to gas, which Trinidad and Tobago is, is more known for, um, drilling of the first gas uh, field started in 1971, gas was discovered, um, and then the actual production and so on of that um, resource came after. Um, so tell us a bit about the transition from oil to gas and explain what the difference is with associated gas such as what we're producing with the oil, and I suspect Trinidad may have initially, and the um, pure LNG that Trinidad is producing now, if that's the correct terminology. Yeah, so Trinidad's relationship with natural gas is as old as its relationship with oil, because as oil is produced, as crude oil is produced, natural gas comes out of the oil. And, Alex, and that's called associated gas. And it's called associated gas because it means it's gas or natural gas associated with oil. In the reservoir, which is thousands of feet below the surface of the, of the earth and under high temperatures, that natural gas is in solution. It's, part, it's chemically part of the, um, of the crude oil. As the oil makes its way to the surface and pressures are reduced and temperatures are reduced, the natural gas comes out of solution. It's pretty much like opening a, a bottle of mineral water, to, to, to use a simple, a simple example. So that's what associated gas is. We also have what is called non-associated gas, which is natural gas, which is produced not as a byproduct of oil production, but natural gas, which is produced by the drilling and production of natural gas reservoirs. And there are definitions um, by the Society of Petroleum Engineers and different profess professional associations as to what is a associated, uh, what is a oil reservoir and what is a gas reservoir. But Trinidad had 
um, started to commercialize its natural gas back in the 1950s, first for power generation and later for ammonia production. So in the 1950s, um, natural gas was utilized for the first time in 1953 for power generation. At that time, prior to that, most of Trinidad's electricity was generated using liquid fuels, um, you know, mainly fuel oil, what we call heavy fuel oil, and, um, and diesel. So in 1953, the journey to converting that totally to natural gas began, to the point where today all the, electric, all the electricity in Trinidad is generated using natural gas. Um, and we also use a significant amount of gas for petrochemicals and for liquefied natural gas. So natural gas to electricity really constitutes about 7 to 8% of all the natural gas that is produced in Trinidad and Tobago. The bulk of the natural gas produced in Trinidad is used to produce um, to make liquefied natural gas, or LNG, which is exported. And that business, that LNG business, has really been the main pillar of Trinidad's economy for the last 21 years. Um, some of the natural gas is used to make ammonia and to make methanol. Um, but so electricity is a, a small subset of the natural gas use in Trinidad. So we have uh, in Trinidad, we have a couple power stations. We have the TGU power plant in Labre which is the newest power plant. Um, there is what we call PowerGen Pinal, PowerGen Point Lisas, Trinity Power. Uh, so that's four power plants in Trinidad, and there's one in Tobago. So it's a total of five power plants on the island. Um, we have an installed capacity of about 2,100 megawatts in Trinidad. And uh, right now, the peak demand in Trinidad is somewhere in the region of 1,350 so yes, we do have excess capacity in Trinidad. And that excess capacity is as a result of a um, couple of things that happened in the last 10 years. One of which is the cancellation of a aluminum smelter. So the a power plant was built to supply the, the aluminum smelter and that smelter was canceled. Uh, secondly, we've had the closure of one of the major steel producers in the country, ArcelorMittal. Um, we've had a closure of the refinery in Trinidad, the oil refinery. So that accounts for that, that big gap between installed capacity and what we call peak demand. So currently in Trinidad, the government is looking now to diversify electricity away from natural gas and towards solar. So to that extent, um, there is a there is a project which is being pursued jointly by BP and Shell to build the country's first um, solar farm or farms. It's actually two solar farms, which would produce about 110 megawatts of power, you know, which is less than 10% of our peak demand and much less than probably 5% of, um, of our installed capacity. So, so that's the power generation scenario they're entering that. But um, what using natural gas to generate electricity has done for Trinidad is that it has allowed Trinidad to generate um, electricity and to sell electricity to the population at probably the second or third lowest rates in the hemisphere. So Trinidad's residential rates. So we have three categories of electricity rates in Trinidad. There's residential rates, there is commercial, there are commercial rates and there are industrial rates. So the residential rates, which is what the average citizen would pay, varies from four US cents per kilowatt hour to six US cents per kilowatt hour, depending on the consumption in your home. The commercial rates, uh, which would be paid by malls and banks and so on, is around eight US cents per kilowatt hour. And industrial rates tend to be about two to three US cents per kilowatt hour. So that those very low prices have really underpinned um, the, the lifestyle, so to speak, or the, the, um, a lot of the prosperity in Trinidad. So um, those low rates have benefited, of course, um, our manufacturing sector. It certainly has benefited the industrial 
customers of um, Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission. Um, but the time is coming very soon when those rates would have to be revised because they have not been revised now for over 10 years. And of That's course, you know, time. of course, you know, there are always political, there's always political anxiety by the incumbent government when it comes to revising utility rates. So governments tend to be very careful with how they interfere with electricity rates and water rates, um, because those are the two things which are, you know, essential for, for life. But the time is coming very soon where I think um, it will become inevitable that we have to revise the electricity rates upward in Trinidad. I mean, for the utility to go 11 years without a, a, a rate increase is pretty, pretty tough for them because their costs have been going up, but their revenue streams remain the same. So, um, so that's that's um, so. But Trinidad has enjoyed um, that cheap and abundant electricity. Um, if you fly over Trinidad at night, it's electrified. Um, and, I mean, every little nook and cranny in Trinidad has a street light. So, but there's a cost to that. Um, but there also are, there's also the environmental benefit of natural gas, um, which is when we had built the power plant in Tobago. I was minister when the power plant was, during the time the power plant was being commissioned. Uh, the power plant in the Cove Industrial Estate in Tobago was initially powered by diesel because we hadn't yet commissioned the natural gas, the natural gas into the power plant. And for a couple of years, the power plant in Tobago ran on diesel. And when you took off from the airport in Tobago, Tobago is a beautiful tropical island. And uh, when you took off from the airport in Tobago, you could see the plume. You could see the plume of diesel, of the of diesel exhaust coming from the power plant. And it wasn't a very attractive thing for an island, which is a tourist island and a tropical island. It's now been replaced by natural gas. And of course, that's cleaner. It's less CO2 intensive. Um, so you, there is an environmental benefit to Guyana replacing its fuel oil and diesel generation and using natural gas. Um, let, me, um, let, 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 let me jump in here. Um, we're going to get into a bit more detail on the environmental side of it. The rates that you refer to for Trinidad, um, Diana is about five or so times higher in terms of uh, yeah. the megawatt per megawatt um, per watt. So that's significant. Um, you did mention Trinidad transition from generating electricity from heavy oil moving on to um, natural gas. Um, one thing I wanted you to explain briefly, because we've heard this term, term being used before, and at the beginning of these conversations concerning getting the gas to shore, we were, um, it was established that this is, uh, at, the, at, at the start, technically feasible. Um, so when we say technically feasible, what do we mean? Um, our field is about 120 miles or so offshore, um, I think that Trinidad's um, offshore production is, is, is closer to shore than, than, than ours are. But when we talk about technical feasibility, what are some of the technical aspects that um, those looking at this very closely would have had to take into consideration? Okay, so the first, the, when we talk about the technical feasibility of gas to power in Guyana, the gas is being produced as part of oil production, which is taking place 120 miles offshore. On a, on a FPSO. So the FPSO would have what is called, they would have what is called separators. And a separator does exactly what the name implies. The function of a separator is to separate the separate water, oil, and gas from, 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 from each other. Um, at the separator, then natural gas is available to whoever wants to make use of the natural gas. So my understanding is that the gas that is currently being produced as a, as a as part of the as part of the LISA production. Some of the gas is being reinjected. Some of the gas is being used for power generation on the FPSO, and some of the gas will be made available when when the time comes to um, for for power generation in. Um, in Guyana. So my understanding is that we're looking at about 50 million cubic feet of gas to be made available 
by the year 2024. It's going to require a pipeline to connect that gas to the shoreline. The pipeline begins in 1,600 meters of water, and the pipeline has to come all the way from that water depth to, to the coastline. So it's moving from 1,600 meters water depth to sea level or zero. Um, it would have to traverse um, what is called the abyssal plain um, under the sea up into the continental slope onto the continental shelf and into, into land. Um, that is not something which is a difficult task to accomplish in today's world. Um, I had pointed out um, recently that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which connects gas from Siberia into Germany, is 760 mile, a 760 mile pipeline, sections of which are underwater. Um, so subsea pipelines are of that length and, and, and so on is, is not uncommon. Of course, in Trinidad, all the gas that we, we get coming onto the island comes from offshore. Um, we don't have any pipelines in Trinidad that are at that water depth yet. Um, that may happen sometime later this decade. But technically, it's, um, it's not difficult to, to do this. Um, let's talk a bit about the economics of it, because that is where I see a lot of concern in the Guyanese media. The cost of a pipeline like that, I estimate to be between 600 million to 800 million US dollars for that length of pipeline and that depth of water. The, the, what really makes the economics work is you have to take the project, this gas to power project, as part of the wider economics of the Starbrook block. So in the Starbrook, Starbrook block production sharing agreement, there is a provision for cost recovery. And as a feature of um, cost recovery, there's what the economists call the cost pool, which is which is your, you know the where all the costs associated with exploration, development, LISA one, LISA two, building the FPS, so on, so on. All that cost goes into what is called the cost pool, and that cost is recovered against revenue as revenue is generated over time. Now you would appreciate that higher oil prices means that the cost pool is going to be recovered faster because the revenue is going to be up. So oil is now about 61, 62 US dollars a barrel. So that's, that's a good thing because you want to get the cost pool down. However, the, the cost of the pipeline and the cost of the facilities on land to receive the gas as a percentage of the monies which are in the cost pool is probably going to be very small. I mean, I'm thinking it's going to be in the single digits of percentage, right? Given the amount of money um, which is in the cost pool. So let's assume that the cost pool has um, 10 billion US dollars. Putting an additional 600 to 800 million US dollars into that is, is less, than, less than 10%. Um, so, I mean, you're looking at... Uh, increase in that cost pool that is in a single digit percentage. So it is not really going to make much of a difference to the overall economics of the, of the um, Starbuck block, because we're talking about massive numbers here for the overall block in terms of revenue and in terms of, of cost recovery. So <clears throat> that is the first point with regard to the economics. Secondly, if you think about it, the gas there is no cost related to or associated to that gas because the gas Exxon did not spend money looking for gas. Exxon did not spend money um, exploring for gas or developing gas. Gas just happens to be a byproduct of the production of oil. So, so, you're, so saying, you're saying the production cost is offset by what the production cost already is to bring up. Yeah, the so, so it, it is. Because the gas just happens to be a byproduct of oil. the oil. It's like bagas when you're making, um, when you're in the process of making sugar. The bagas just happens to be 
a byproduct of the sugar manufacturing process, which could then be used for value added, value added um, industries. So the, the the only the only cost really to this project is the cost of the pipeline, of laying the pipeline, and the cost of the receiving infrastructure on land. Now, what is the receiving infrastructure on land? The receiving infrastructure on land is there's something called a slug catcher. And we have three slug catchers in Southeast Trinidad. Um, that slug catcher's role and purpose. And we are not 100% sure whether a slug catcher would be needed, but um, I think it would. Uh, the purpose of the slug catcher is to, is to sort of smoothen out the flow of gas as the gas approaches the shoreline. Um, because the gas could be coming in what they call two-phase flow. Um, which is where you have slugs of liquid and gas, slugs of liquid and gas. So it is um, almost as if you're pulling up on a straw and you're seeing liquid and space and liquid and space. So the purpose of the slug catcher is to smoothen out that or else you're going to have an uh, uneven type of flow. And then the second piece of infrastructure is a... Is a, a so a this plant. slug catcher, just for clarity, the slug catcher is a separate bit of infrastructure that is located just off the... Coast. As the pipeline makes landfall. Okay. As the pipeline makes landfall. So then the, 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 more, the, the, the more important facility would be the facility which um, is to condition the gas or to fractionate the gas into, um, into methane and ethane and propane and so on. So more than likely, a power plant would need methane. Right, which is the simplest of the hydrocarbons. Um, power, so the power plant gets what they call C1 and C2, which is methane and ethane. Everything else, which is C3 plus. C3 is propane. C4 is um, butane. Um, and for, you know, just for the, the purposes of people's reference to this conversation, propane is cooking gas. Propane is also called LPG, right? Um, so in Trinidad, our LPG is a, a mixture of propane and butane, but it's more propane. So I think it's about 85% propane and some butane. Butane, for those of you all who are not familiar with butane, butane is what you have in your cigarette lighter. So if you see a cigarette lighter, um, the liquid in cigarette lighter is butane. And then beyond that, you have pentane and, and, and hexane and so on. So those are valuable liquids. And I could tell uh, my my understanding, Chris, is that the associated natural gas coming down that pipeline is rich in what they call natural gas liquids or NGLs, right? Um, and that has value from the point of view of supplying Guyana with cooking gas one, um, and supplying Guyana with cooking gas at a lower cost than is currently being supplied because you would be importing your cooking gas right now from somewhere. Um, maybe Trinidad. And then the liquids that are beyond propane and butane could be, could be exported, natural gas liquids, or could be used for manufacturing type industries in Guyana. So that is the, that is so, so one, the project has the potential to reduce the cost of cooking gas. And two, it will, in my estimation, reduce the cost of um, electricity to the public by 50 to 60 percent let's, um, uh, let's 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 delve a bit more into what you started to touch on the primary um purpose in most people's mind here in guyana bringing gas to shore the immediate impact to them would be cheaper electricity um immediately based on the volume of of, of gas that exxon would have said is offshore about 20 percent of what they would have found so far and what is intended to um, be piped to shore. Um, how big of an industry do you think we can develop or industries um, that would be a spin-off benefit from bringing this gas to shore? So we have the primary benefit of cheaper electricity, and then what else could feasibly come after? So cheaper electricity by, four, by 50 to 60%, cheaper LPG, right? Um, savings in foreign exchange because you're not going to have to expend foreign exchange now to buy fuel oil and LPG. But then there is also the government of Guyana, the president 
has been talking about a very exciting project, which is gaster protein. And I know when I explain that to, to people, even people who are seasoned people in your industry, they, they don't know what that is, right? because it's not a popular thing. It's not like ammonia and methanol. Uh, break so, it up for us, Kevin. Gaster protein. So you're taking natural gas and you're making amino acid chains, right? So amino acid chains, um, amino acid chains are the building blocks for protein. So those of you all who do bodybuilding, right? Or I don't know if Chris, if you ever did any bodybuilding in your. Or if I you never went to did the gym. bodybuilding, but I used to drink a protein powder to feel. Right. Like so I'm those sorry. those protein powders are made up of amino acids. Uh, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So in Trinidad, we have a pilot plant at the University of Trinidad and Tobago that is supposed to be doing gaster protein. I don't know if the plant is operational because I haven't been um, updated about that plant. Um, but gaster protein is being done commercially in, in Norway. And I'm told it's being done commercially in Germany. And this protein um, is used to make animal feed. It's used to make um, feed for cattle and for chicken and so on. So it is a potential linkage between the natural gas and the agricultural sector, which is Guyana's major, major um, non-energy type industry. There is also potential, in my opinion, for more natural gas to come down that pipeline as years progress and more FPSOs come in to production. Because ultimately, as, as Alistair Routledge pointed out, there's a significant amount of natural gas out there. 20% um, of 8 billion barrels of oil equivalent is 1.6 billion barrels of oil equivalent, which when converted into gas is 9.6 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Now that gas is, um, uh, that presents a, a huge development uh, opportunity for Guyana. And I think that, um, you know, you there, there's need for, a well thought out natural gas master plan type document for the country as to how the country plans to use the gas. Because I say that because that tranche of gas which will make landfall in 2024 may well be the beginning of, of the gas story in Guyana. Um, and you have to appreciate that there is very little, Exxon has very few options for natural gas offshore. Option one is to re-inject but there's only so much you could re-inject, as we have discovered, right? Option two is to use for power generation on the FPSO, but there's only so much we could use for that. And option three is to commercialize. And somewhere in between, if things go wrong, as they recently went wrong with the compressor on the Lisa Destiny, you, the, the only option is to either shut in oil production or to flare, right? And nobody wants to shut in oil production and nobody wants to flare. So increasingly, as the decade progresses, I think more gas will be making its way to the coastline. And therefore, the question arises, you know, what is the best way to use this gas to develop industries that are sustainable, and that could create jobs and so on. So we've that, heard that's... A lot of talk. We've, we've heard a lot of talk as we speak about utilizing the gas of Guyana potentially becoming an exporter of this commodity. Is that overambitious? Or... Um, no, it's not overambitious at all. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I think um, about that. When I was Minister of Energy in Trinidad, um, I would sometimes meet gold mining companies. Some of the... Canadian gold mining companies and so on, um, when they were passing through Trinidad, they would come to see me. And one of the reasons that they were coming to see me is that they, they explained to me, the gold miners explained to me that one of the biggest cost items that they had was diesel. I got diesel, as you know, if you've been into the interior, if you've been into a gold mine, and I want to say I have, right? You um, have I've been, in Guyana. I've, uh, what, what is that? I said you have here too in Guyana. Yeah, I have been into the interior. I've seen the gold mining industry. Diesel is the lifeblood of gold mining. Um, and if you can, I'm told that fuel accounts for probably 30 to 40% of the cost of running a gold mining operation. So if you could re re 
replace that now with LNG. And LNG technology has evolved to the point where you have what they call small scale LNG. You have something called LNG in a box. Demerara Distillers Limited is importing small volumes of LNG from somewhere in Jamaica um, to, to use in their facility. So there is the potential for small scale LNG in Guyana. Large scale LNG on the level of what happens in Trinidad to, to economically justify a train of LNG, the size of what you have in Trinidad, you would need to have reserves of the magnitude of, let's say, four to five trillion cubic feet of gas. So you would need to cobble together a significant amount of gas and you would have to make sure that the supply is there for 20 years to justify the LNG train. But I could tell you that LNG, as well as renewables, uh, you follow the global industry now. LNG is certainly a growth industry. Um, gas is going to be around for a growth industry for a long while. Um, one of the things that the Guyanese government may wish to do is to have an independent third party assessment of the reserves that have been discovered thus far. And that, I mean, there are many firms um, around the world, out of the US and the UK that do that kind of thing. And that will give you an idea of how much resource you have. So right now we, we have some figures and those figures have been given to us by Exxon out of their reporting. We have the Exxon um, Securities and Exchange Commission reports which are publicly available. But it would be useful for the Guyanese government to have an independent third party assessment. Um, I don't want to call the names of companies, but um, because people might say I'm favoring that company. But there's one company that is a household name in Trinidad, Chris. Um, it's a company that does the reserves audit for natural gas in Trinidad. And um, it's a, the taxi drivers know the name of the company in Trinidad because the the, re, the results of our annual natural gas audit are keenly followed by, by, by the public in Trinidad. And people in Trinidad always worry about gas running out and so on. So I think that uh, uh, audit like that will give the Guyanese government a good idea of what sort of resource base they're playing with. And then that will inform industrial strategy, industrial planning going forward. Let's look at um, the, the environmental impact. Um, there are genuine concerns here in Guyana uh, about the environment across the board, not just specific to oil and gas. Um, but as you know, we live in an era where there is more awareness and efforts being made to ensure that we preserve the environment um, for future generations. You mentioned at the start of the conversation, Trinidad having multiple facilities um, set up across the, the, the Twin Island um, as it relates to production of uh, gas and gas-related material. Um, how has Trinidad been able to produce gas, develop gas in a, in a way that is not detrimental to the environment? And what major hiccups would Trinidad have experienced along the way in that regard? Well, you, you have to appreciate that gas and the production of gas in itself is a, is a less environmentally intrusive industry than oil. Um, we've always heard about oil spills, right? You've never heard about a gas spill, right? Because natural gas is natural gas. Most of it is gaseous. Some of it is liquid and it's a very light liquid, right? So, so if you see the condensate, which is associated with natural gas, it, is, it, is, it looks almost like you're looking at gasoline. It smells similar to gasoline, right? So it's... Um, that's the first thing. So there is, with regard to gas, there is less environmental degradation associated with potential spills and so on. The, so the, 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 main, the main concern of, of gas is that um, I think there are some concerns about the pipeline and about the pipeline approach um, to the shoreline and possible, um, you know, of course, the pipeline has to make landfall somewhere. And that somewhere is going to be the West, the West Bank or the West Coast. And I think once the Environmental Protection Agency or whatever you call it in Guyana, the EPA, they would that is their job to ensure that the pipeline is built to 
environmental standards and so on. But we have never really had problems in Trinidad, environmental problems with the natural gas industry. The problems have been with the oil industry. And I know that all too well um, because under my watch, there were two significant oil spills at Petrotrin, which, which um, you know, cost me a lot of gray hair, right? Um, one happened during Christmas, Christmas 2013. There was a major oil spill in South Trinidad. And the other one happened in, um, in mid-2014 in the refinery itself. So we've, the, 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 the environmental problems in Trinidad are really, are really more associated with, um, with oil, right? Um, Exxon is a company that, that went through a very traumatic experience in, 19, in the late 1980s. The Valdez. Um, the Valdez. And I, you know, I know this because at that time I was in, I was in Form 6. And we had to study the Exxon Valdez accident as part of our general paper. There was a subject called general paper in A-levels. And um, after the Exxon Valdez, I think Exxon made a commitment to safety, to HSC. Um, it is similar to what happened to BP in 2010 when there was a Macondo oil spill. Um, since then, BP has really taken a decision to turn the screws very tightly on a, on HSC. So I think that, um, you know, I don't think, I think that there's always going to be a risk, an environmental risk, but I think it's a lot less with gas, right? Um, the, the impact on the environment is going to be when the pipeline makes a landfall, um, the pipeline route itself, you know, whether the pipeline passes through any environmentally sensitive areas and so on, um, on under the water. Um, but pipelines, Enough of them, you know, pipelines are not really environmentally intrusive. They just sit in the, under, under the water and so on. And um, once there's no spill, then it doesn't really affect the environment. Uh, let's take a look at the regulatory and the institutional framework that uh, would have established and set up over the years um, that works not just for oil, but um, gas production and production of gas-related material. Um, you're very familiar with uh, Diana and where we are. We discovered oil just in 2015, five to six years ago. Um, production started um, rapidly um, just under five years. And we are now, as you well know, um, trying to put together the systems that need to be in place to manage the oil industry. What are some of the key things we need to have in place for gas? Well, gas, Trinidad doesn't have a specific natural gas act. Um, what Trinidad has is something called the Petroleum Act, which is a 1969, which was which was a piece of law passed in 1969, which has been amended many times. So the natural gas industry was sort of accounted for from a regulatory point of view in um, in that law, right? So so I would think that the Petroleum Commission, which is going to be set up in Guyana. Um, for which uh, a bill would have to be laid in parliament, debated and passed and so on, that the Petroleum Commission would have the responsibility for regulatory oversight of natural gas. Um, with, regard, with regard to gas, the oversight, the regulatory oversight is pretty much the same as oil. Um, you look things like metering, right? Um, would, would be something which would be under the remit of the Petroleum Commission. Um, things like, you know, measuring the quantities of natural gas transmitted and the quality of natural gas, right? Because the, the value of natural gas is related to what they call the calorific value of the gas, which is the, and that is related to the amount of liquids the gas has to. So the more heat that you could generate from a unit of natural gas is the more value. So all those things would have to be determined by, uh, in the, by the regulator. Um, so those, those would be, that would be where the regulator will, the regulator is also going to have responsibility for pipeline licenses. So you, if you have to lay a pipeline, you need to have a license to lay the pipeline. Um, and that license is a product of several agencies, such as the agency in charge of state land, right? Because as you would appreciate, the 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 um the sea is state land. I mean, we don't think about it as land, but the sea is actually your territorial sea, 
and your exclusive economic zone and so on. Those all form part of what is called state land. So um, pipeline licenses um, and also re the regular inspection of pipelines. So I just want to give the Trinidadian experience here. So given that all our electricity in Trinidad comes from natural gas, it means, therefore, that the natural gas infrastructure of Trinidad and Tobago is not only an economic priority, it's also a national security priority. So it is for that is one of the reasons why the Minister of Energy in Trinidad sits on the National Security Council, right? Because he is not there to give his opinion about bandits and and, and criminals breaking in, you know. Um, he's there because of the strategic value of, of gas infrastructure and energy infrastructure. So um, in, in our country, the, the, the authorities, the army and so on, patrol the natural gas pipeline routes and so on to ensure that nobody is compromising it. You know, so it is, um, so part of the regulatory oversight of natural gas infrastructure to is security of those, of those assets. And increasingly, I think that is going to become an issue for Guyana, the security of his energy infrastructure. Because as the energy infrastructure grows, um, you always have the risk of people wanting, people who may want to interfere, right? That is a very big, that is a very big issue in Nigeria. Um, okay, so where, about, you know, you're speaking primarily about internal forces and internal actors in terms of that interference? Well, you know, just, you know, you just have to, you, you can't just leave the infrastructure unattended, right? Because you never know, there's always a risk to somebody who may want to do some mischief, right? So part, part of the regulatory oversight of energy infrastructure is national security, is a role that national security plays. Um, so therefore, I would think, for example, that Guyana now, given that, given that your economic livelihood is becoming more and more offshore, um, you would want to have greater assets available to the Coast Guard and so on, so that they could monitor um, what is happening offshore and so on. And sometimes it's not necessarily um, anything related to do with any sort of Sometimes it could be accidents and so on. We have had incidents where rogue, rogue barges, I mean, there are barges in the sea that just float around the world. I, I, I didn't know that. Um, sometimes rogue barges just heading towards your platform. And you have to get, um, you know, the Coast Guard to get out there and sort of, and pull it away, right? So, so the, in terms of regulatory oversight, um, you know, the security, the security of assets um, is important. Being able to, to, to manage the industry through the you know, granting of licenses for pipelines and so on. Pipeline right-of-ways, the pathways that pipelines take and so on would have to be something which is done in tandem with your planning division and your, your state lands division and so on. So it's, a, it's quite a, a huge task that will be presented to the regulator, which I assume would be eventually the Petroleum Commission. Okay. Uh, and finally, Kevin, we just have about five minutes remaining. Um, many see where we are, Guyana, that is, um, in terms of our hydrocarbon development as a plus and a minus. Um, a minus meaning that there is now a smaller window remaining for uh, oil, oil production, utilization of resources, <laughs> but a plus in terms of we would have, or we're in a place where we can benefit immensely from the experiences of other countries, such as Trinidad and Tobago and elsewhere. Um, sitting where we are now today, what would be maybe one or two of the key things that you would advise Guyana on as we move forward in the development of our hydrocarbon resources? This is broad now, not just related to gas. Well, I mean, broad, broadly speaking, I, I want to say, I mean, you know, I've been coming to Guyana regularly for the last five years. And one of the things that always surprises me is the level of negativity towards the industry. I mean, I, this is just my honest. Before, before a drop of oil was produced, uh, you and I had this conversation a few times. Before a drop of oil was produced, there was so much negativity, right? And I think when I look at, when I look at what has happened, I mean, Guyana hasn't done badly. 
Um, when you look at local content, for example, yes, there's a lot of work to do with local content, and there is a lot of a lot more involvement of the Guyanese private sector that could happen. But by and large, um, when you look at what has happened, when you look at the amount of Guyanese who have been trained and are working on the FPSOs and the drill ships, and you look at the shore base and so on, and you look at what is coming potentially, more shore bases could be coming or will be coming. Uh, I think Guyana has not done badly. Secondly, I think that the cost of producing a barrel of oil in Guyana's deep water is very competitive. Um, when you stack it up against the break-even cost in, let's say, shallow water Trinidad, right? Um, the break-even cost of producing oil in Guyana will keep the industry alive in difficult times. So when oil prices go into the 20s and the 30s, as happened last year, um, it is not something which will cause you to get, you know, a uh, heart attack in Guyana. The industry survived last year. Um, and it is because of the low, the low cost of producing a, bar, a unit of oil compared to other deep water provinces around the world, right? So I think Guyana, in terms of oil and gas, should, I think that the country hasn't done badly. Um, going forward, there's of course a need to institutionalize the industry in Guyana through the establishment of the Petroleum Commission and the passage of the legislation to support that. Um, there is an ongoing need to continue to educate the population and create the skills, res skills resource base. Um, but even so, um, a lot of Guyanese have transitioned from manufacturing and from gold mining and from the bauxite industry and so on into the oil industry. And the transition has happened pretty quickly. And I think it, it, it has a lot to do with the fact that I think Guyanese and Trinidadians are, are very adaptable people. And, um, and the fact that we speak English and so on also helps. You know? So I think that there's a lot to be proud of thus far, and there's a lot more work to be done. I think the government is on the right track with, um, with putting their foot down for local content. And I think they, they are taking local content um, very seriously. And I think they're also taking this gas to power project very seriously. And both are, those two things, the gas to power and the local content are, are very important for the sustainable economic development of the country. So I think that it's, it's, it's uh, so far so good, right? All right, so I'll definitely be inviting you back, Kevin, at some point in time soon for a discussion on local content. You were part of the local content panel that the president uh, put together here in Guyana. Um, a draft would have since been... Yes, and, that, and that, that work on developing the local content policy and so on, uh, it continues. Um, so I see the ministry um, recently on their Facebook page were having consultations. Yes, they're doing a series of consultations. Yeah. Um, well, thanks again, Kevin Ramnarine, okay. for being on the program, former Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs. I just did mention, too, that uh, Kevin played a key role on the local content panel that uh, consulted and advised the government and president on what we should do going forward. Um, so thanks again, Kevin, for coming in. Um, we enjoyed speaking with you, and we look forward to um, you being on the program again. Okay, Chris. Take care. Okay. Bye.